This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. I'm your host, Dolores, and today we are finishing our discussion on Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. But before we get to that, I just wanted to give you guys an update on what is going to be happening with the podcast in the months to come, and also everything else that is going on right now over at lowres.live. However, before I even get to that, I just wanted to let you guys know that there is this comedian out there that I have been aware of for maybe about a year or so, who popped up during the beginning of the culture war, who goes by Owen Benjamin. And Owen Benjamin is this, I don't even know how to describe him comedically, I, he's ventured into the politics as of late, which I think is much to the detriment of the quality of his material, but I wasn't really that big of a fan to begin with, to be quite honest with you. I just logged on to Facebook, and I'm in quite a few groups or whatever. Sometimes I, I wind up there without even realizing it. People can just add you to things, but this is a, a cult that I belong to. Not like Nexium, not like on the last episode what we were talking about. Certainly not, no, no, no. But someone had posted this video of Owen Benjamin talking about the moon landing and, aptly enough, Stanley Kubrick, who is, of course, the director of the movie we're talking about tonight with The Critical Unbeliever. The, the, the evidence is overwhelming to the point where I'm not that even interested in talking about the evidence anymore. Just start off with the fact that you're backing the SS as honest and not wizards. And then go from there. Talk how much electricity you need to broadcast a live TV station with audio right now in America in 2018. Then talk about the distance. Talk about w what they were capable of in 1968, uh, how that's possible. Uh, someone brought up a point that because of the... Uh, the uh, See, this is what happens constantly when, when debating someone about this, which is why I might just completely stop. Like I was debating someone about this and they said, well, you know, because of the speed of, of light, um, it took like two and a half seconds or something to get the audio, there was a delay, and so they would edit it so that it sounded the way we all heard it. And so, I don't know if that's true or not, but see, the follow-up questions, I go, so, so were they editing it live? How is that possible? How would they edit live? Because that was linear editing. It isn't non-linear editing. It's like uh, Final Cut Pro and all that stuff still impossible to do live unless there's a big delay and it's only one thing you can't edit all the gaps dang, 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 live right so then the person immediately says you know they look confused for a second but then their brain is searching for like how is it still possible it's like oh they they did it before and then broadcast it i'm like so it wasn't live like you just with your thing that you said <laughs> with with like the thing you said that would disprove me you just Prove me more right. So if they're rebroadcasting something they previously edited, you just admitted it wasn't live. Another NASA astronaut in an outrage to try and like say how dumb people like me are was like, yes, Stanley Kubrick shot some fo the footage of the moon landing in case something went wrong. We could play that. I, people know that, but that doesn't mean we didn't go to the moon. In fact, that gives no evidence. And we, I'm like, hey, asshole, you just admitted that Stanley Kubrick shot the moon landing, right? You have to understand, people have been de denied that for decades. So now we're dealing with a group of people that just admitted to something they did denied for decades as they're ranting about how stupid we are because the fact Stanley Kubrick shot footage for promotional reasons or in case the feed went out doesn't disprove anything it's like well now you're you, you just admitted that you publicly lied to the people for decades and everyone's like yeah but but and that's when someone in, in the family told me to shut up and then i'm ruining the dinner and all that there is this conspiracy on the internet and we've delved quite a bit into the many conspiracies of this film but there's this conspiracy regarding Stanley Kubrick's involvement with NASA and faking the moon landing that occurred in 1969. And Owen Benjamin seems to believe that this is indeed the case, that Stanley Kubrick was incorporated into the fold by NASA to film artificial footage of a moon landing. And this is, uh, this is very concerning. 
I mean, I would be concerned if I was a member of Owen Benjamin's household. Uh, there's many people that buy into this idea, but Owen Benjamin in particular, he's a, you know, he, he, he's an unhinged lunatic is what I'm getting at here. This guy is Howard Beale. No, actually, I, I let me walk that back. Tim Pool is becoming Howard Beale. But Owen Benjamin is not far off from living on a street corner with a shopping cart as his home. This is a fairly prominent conspiracy on the internet. If you go on YouTube, you're going to find a lot about that. If you go on Reddit, probably the same. There is a connection between Stanley Kubrick and NASA in that he had consulted NASA for the visuals of 2001 A Space Odyssey. He wanted to get everything as accurate as humanly possible because he was this meticulous genius and i you know i i to uh dive off of the owen benjamin discussion which was really unproductive there i was i honestly i just wanted to take a couple of shots at owen benjamin uh i get this new book the stanley kubrick archives and it's a earlier edition of the book which uh you know has been repackaged and formatted for mass distribution as of late but it's a very informative catalog of details regarding his entire filmography and i've uh, I, i've actually been reading more so about his unmade projects because i have that penchant for unfinished films and i've been reading a lot about the arian papers which is perhaps the least prestigious out of the list of movies that were ultimately unrealized i think napoleon is the most it, it has the most attention and the most uh, interest surrounding it so much so that there is a a separate archival book dedicated to simply the work that he put into making that movie that ultimately got scrapped there's a segment in here about ai which wound up in the hands of steven spielberg in 2000 or 2001 but the aryan papers is a movie that is often ignored in terms of kubrick's lore and it would have been interesting had it not been squashed single-handedly by steven spielberg and his need to rush schindler's list out in 1993 and also steal the would-be lead actor of the aryan papers for jurassic park all very fascinating stuff if you're a, a, an obsessive nerd like yours truly anyhow i think we are going to get into the latest episode of movies now where we will be talking about eyes wide shut and again, many of the conspiracies that surround this film. So please enjoy, and if you would like to contribute to movies and everything that is low res Wonder Bread, head on over to patreon.com slash low res. I hand out the episodes. I hand them out. I personally gift them to you uh, in person. I offer the episodes of this show early to those who contribute $1 or more. So if that is something that would interest you, please go ahead and do that. Patreon.com slash Lores. In the meantime, enjoy our conversation. To, to me, it seems like it would have to be a part of the narrative that everything that we've seen has been a big setup, right? From the from from the ballroom all the way up to this exact moment to him coming into his room and seeing his mask there yeah. next to Alice. That the, everything has been a direct setup for you know whatever ends uh the the group is looking for i don't know what else to call them besides like the group the cult mm -hmm. um it seems like it would it would add to that it seems like if ziegler was in on it it would make sense for him to convey in some way to bill that yes i'm you know that yes something happened but you know bro shut up because that's again that's what i got from that conversation was hey shut up about this play along with this everything is fine if you just play along with this and then as bill leaves and he's like man that guy's a freaking asshole and shouldn't have you know shouldn't have come at me like that and he's being followed and then the presence those all seem like intimidation tactics you know said yeah. tantamount him up to the group that actually that the real tom cruise is a part of Somebody just fall down the stairs there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Essentially that. Sorry about that. Well, I, I do think it gives more credence to the idea that this was an elaborate ruse from the jump. Because, again, the mask on the pillow is an absolute power move, especially when he begins that conversation prior to Bill going home as, oh, I'm your friend, I'm looking out for you. So he knows he's going to motherfuck him at, at the end of it once all is said and done. The takeaway 
from Ziegler uh, that Bill is supposed to have is don't mess with this guy. Uh, is that, that's, that seems to me like uh, the most plausible. The true ending itself, which is Bill and Alice in the department store going over the facts and uh, the end line, which is that she wants to go home and fuck. What is, what is that what is that supposed to mean? What what is Kubrick saying by ending the film on that note? Is it just like a little humorous takeaway? Like what or or is, do you think there's some kind of intention behind that? Well, it could be it could be wrapping up the theme of sexual suppression, right? Sure. So we've, yeah. we've seen this whole time that maybe she's a super slut, maybe he's kind of asexual and is coming to terms with it or maybe he's afraid of intimacy in so, in some way. And it comes to a head where at least one of the characters is now fully confirmed in whatever their sexuality is, right? No longer going to suppress those feelings. They've kind of, as they note, they've been through it, right? They've mm-hmm. they've had uh, the roughest patch they're ever going to have over the course of, like, what, two days? Right. And it could essentially be her being like, you know what? But I'm, I'm tired of being... Uh, ashamed of the fact that I wanted to get railed by that sailor. Let's 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 go home and bang. But it's a Kubrick film, and I've always thought that the the point of Kubrick films is for you to discuss what you, you know, like. What what was he actually trying to tell me, and to fight over that? So I that's what I think that it's very possible that it's the end of that storyline where these people were sexually suppressed, and now look, now they're not. Why don't we get into the technical aspects of this film? If we're talking about the how, the, the, how technical the film is, I think far too many people use it as like their template for what they want to do with their future you know, passion project. Mm-hmm. But I honestly don't think enough people have the eye to create something so layered and nuanced as far as technical ability with framing lighting um, some of the shots that a lot of people think don't make sense make perfect sense after you've seen the film uh, specifically the it's not a whole long shot but the the long shot that it's a pan from left to right of the doctor's office that you know bill works in and in low in low resolution you can't see all the the, the details but if you look close enough you could see that the, the theme of his surveillance is being played out in that room where there's a camera that actually faces the camera a little bit. Um, there's a warning sign talking about that you're being watched at, at all times. It demonstrates like the hierarchy that he's from the on the wall where it shows a series of doctors and who he's positioned at the top. Um, but it's also in that specific scene, it's also low light, uh, red, dark, and that's actually one of the one of the only scenes outside of the orgy that has a genuinely ominous like like aesthetic to it where a lot mm-hmm. of the rest of it is either uh, palleted for you to see like just for clarity or like in the ballroom case very well lit and and you know conveying that positive aesthetic have you noticed something that has taken root within a lot of film criticism circles on the internet where people seem to be devaluing Kubrick's intent in a lot of his shots. Like the one thing that I see talked about most often or used as evidence that he wasn't as deliberate of a filmmaker as uh, perhaps he actually was or what the legend entails is uh, a chair being in a particular shot in The Shining in one sequence and then it disappears when they cut back, uh, obviously this is a, a get, you know it's a goof, it, mm-hmm. it's a technical error. It wasn't something to unnerve the viewer, unlike what you may hear in room two thirty seven or, or or some other uh, person's interpretation of what was being communicated uh, in those sequences. I also I I happen to believe that Kubrick was probably closer to the legend that we all have of him than he wasn't. And I think you you have that takeaway as well uh, yeah. from him as a filmmaker. The lighting, which seems to be a more natural lighting in some of these scenes, like the bar sequence, they rely heavily on Christmas lights, which is 
I, I like that a lot. I think it lends itself to building an atmosphere for this film. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of the the New York City set that doesn't feel at all like New York City, even if it shares some visual similarities to it? Yeah, that has that seems to add to the like dreamlike aesthetic, you know? Yeah. Is it seems that it's it's lit and colored more vibrantly than you would expect uh, New York at the time, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, the New York nighttime especially it the 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 whole aesthetic in that in those particular scenes when he's walking the streets at night it doesn't have that gritty grimy you know New York flavor that you would expect to to find a, a prostitute in a porn shop you know a me- a Mexican cafe no and, definitely and not it it so a lot of times I think people will focus on what the right aesthetic is for this to feel like the right part of New York. But to me, I think that it's an intentional choice to, to, to shoot those and light those like that and have that set almost seem it, it to, to me, it looks very much like a set. Like they didn't go to New York and film that on the street. It seems like it's inside studio B. Well, I was going to, what I was going to lead that to was, do you think, Kubrick is trying to put out almost like a dreamy atmosphere. Yeah, that's that's City. I think it's an intentionally, you know, dreamy aesthetic where this this imaginary New York sex happens and it isn't so um it isn't so like dark and gross as it will be later on. You know, in, mm-hmm. in this case, he comes across a prostitute that doesn't look like a crack whore, but she ends up being HIV positive. Right? right. He he uh, walks by a flower shop and it's got people making out in front of it. You know, it's like this uh, reference to, you know, flowers and love, people making out in front of it. And then the next thing that happens is a dude talks about, oh, she had a Mexican rose in her mouth and was, or she had a rose in her mouth and was riding me with the, you know, Mexican lap <laughs> dance. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, knocks, knocks Bill over. I think that those things are supposed to seem separated from reality. You know, it's not like... Mm-hmm. It's because the whole the whole film has those different aspects where a lot of the orgy feels like it's rooted in reality. You know, it's yeah. it doesn't have that haze. It doesn't have that dreamlike haze to it where just those scenes of him even being inside of, of Domino's uh, apartment room or whatever it is like those don't necessarily feel like they're set in the real world as more as they are this dream kind of context. Absolutely. Do you think that anything was lost regarding the storyline and the themes of the film as a result of Kubrick dying before its completion? Obviously, he had finished a cut where it was simply to appease Warner Brothers, I think, and show something to the cruises at the time. Well, didn't doesn't doesn't his daughter essentially say that the the movie was made and whatever like what we see is the edit that he was uh, that he intended isn't that what she claims? I don't be- I I don't know I, I I have no idea what what she has claimed about that. All I know is what I've read and what I've watched, and I know that Leon Vitali had a hand in doing the final edits of the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I I find that very difficult to believe if she is saying that, and the movie itself didn't even have its score or, or, or soundtrack done when it was screened for Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, and the Warner Brothers executives. Right. Which means it was still very early on in the post-production process. Because if you know anything about editing, even if you're just you know on YouTube mm-hmm. and you happen to uh, work with things that require music, you will often edit around the music. Like you, that, that plays a fundamental part. Yeah. In the process. So this movie was probably, you know, I, how I edit is I go through drafts. So something I'm editing now is the first episode of a, a, of a series I'm going to have come out on the channel in 2019. I got to do four drafts an episode. This was probably draft one of three for Kubrick mm-hmm. is my guess. Well, I feel like the the story is indicative of that, like or is evidence of that. In that you have, uh, I think actually you pointed out in one of your videos that 
we have this long sequence with the the Frenchman and Alice in the beginning. I can't remember that guy's name. S- S- Ted. Suarez. His name's Ted, Ted. Ted Danson, I believe it was. <laughs> Ted Danson. <laughs> yeah, him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that you have this this um this long scene with him that I if we're only supposed to learn about Alice's character, then I feel like the dialogue is would be shifted into this more of a uh, a battle for control that you would see in a lot of uh, one-on-one interactions with people like that. But in this case, you have a very give and take, even like flirtatious conver- conversation that goes on for several minutes mm-hmm. and then nothing comes of it. If I take, if you take Alice out other than the fact that she gets jealous and Bill doesn't, that scene doesn't do much. And I've always wondered if 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 Kubrick has enough time to do all the edits, right? If he doesn't die and actually gets to make the film that he wants to make to completion, do we understand more about that interaction? Like, is it brought to us that maybe the French the 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 <laughs> Ted Danson <laughs> yeah. is uh, uh you know involved directly in the sex cults and the cults, or do we hear from Alice that that interaction? helped her understand uh, that how intimate she wants to be i I've, so it's it's my opinion that yeah if kubrick ha- gets a little bit more time there's things that you have that a lot of people have open questions about that probably would have been answered or explained better hmm. because i it, go ahead i i'm actually of the opposite mind there my assumption is that if kubrick had time to put the finishing touches on eyes wide shut that it would be more vague because anything regarding Kubrick's editing that you can read about on online is will 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 tell you that he's a guy who doesn't really add on to the movies and editing he just perpetually uh chips away at the film like, I believe there was a story about, maybe it was 2001 or, or Clockwork Orange, where he was editing and just cutting away scenes on the boat ride to the premiere. <laughs> so Eyes Wide Shut obviously had something like 24 minutes removed from what they had shot into that first draft of the of the movie. My guess is just that you would have seen certain scenes rearranged or, or maybe trimmed down even more so uh, than what we have gotten but there you know that doesn't necessarily mean that it wouldn't have been a clearer picture somehow you could have had alternate takes in there or maybe just different sequences shorter does not necessarily mean that we are losing something from the central storyline so well i mean even if you you could take you could cut down the dance like alice's dance you could cut down his uh walk through the city you could cut a number of things that wouldn't like dramatically change the storyline, but would mm-hmm. prevent loose ends. You know, so it we Absolutely. probably we probably wouldn't be talking about a lot of the uh, a, a gay undertone, a gay undercurrent, if uh, he doesn't have the interaction with the uh, I guess jocks, right? There weren't Letterman codes. If he doesn't have that interaction, because then there's there's too too little evidence for it. Um, maybe we have less to think about the infidelity of Alice and or the potential that she actually has that she actually did uh, see that sailor, the sailor encounter is real. If uh, that interaction with the, the Frenchman early on is also not, uh, is also shorter, you know? So mm-hmm. maybe it closes the possibility for loose ends rather than uh, actually closing loose ends. Were you aware that Kubrick had intended to strip this character down of any of his more interesting edges from the book, like to the point of redundancy almost, where he had kind of pictured Bill as this milk toast Protestant kind of guy. I, I, the guy in the, the book, uh, Trom Novell, mm-hmm. is uh, Jewish, I believe. And he even stripped that aspect of him away. I, I, could, I could see that maybe this character has, you know, too much revealing information regarding his personality you know um like i said i definitely think dude 
doesn't necessarily understand how to fit in with like society doesn't get it all the way and that mm. that that seems like a lot well, more than needed do you think that is intended to clash against the whole not necessarily wholesome but just the very generic appearance of this bill harford character yeah I, well there's like encoded messages right so rob Eger would say that the the time the time that it shows uh, Bill walking around the newspaper and it just is like cool, cool as ice on it or something like that. that yeah. that's supposed yeah. to be a direct reference to, like this is Tom Cruise, uh, the, this cool, sexy, sleek guy. But then what we're seeing, although we know it's Tom Cruise, what we're seeing is this, this socially awkward dude that maybe can't get a boner, maybe can't even bang a prostitute if he gets one. Like we're seeing someone who has uh, so, so, social character flaws. But being portrayed by somebody that we perceive, at least at the time, 1999 opinions of Tom Cruise, he, the, the guy's essentially untouchable, you know? Yeah. So. And that that is something that carried through with the alternative casting choices that had uh, occurred prior to Tom Cruise being the final choice for Bill Hartford. You, you take a look at Alec Baldwin, and it's a similar situation right. uh, to Tom Cruise. Or even you could you could even maybe squint your eyes and see Steve Martin filling that same kind of role, but maybe in a slightly different way. Well, I think absolutely. Not hearing that Steve Martin was a potential for it, I think as uh, so, somebody that really likes the the medium of film, right? That to me, that makes perfect sense because we're talking about a, a comedic actor, a prop comedy actor, mm -hmm. somebody who who's, you know, maybe more known for uh, uh, um, being family friendly, but raunchy. You know what I mean? Like, sure, not too raunchy to watch with the whole family, but yeah, still, he's a PG thirteen kind of right. Comedian he's like, yeah, he's not 70s, Andrew Dice 80s. Clay exactly, and, and having him put in that situation, having. You as the viewer see Steve Martin attend to uh, attend this uh, crazy. If we're if we're saying 1980s, the orgy I imagine Kubrick filming in the 80s is a lot different. The orgy I imagine him filming in the 90s, and that could be a better contrast than cool, sexy Tom Cruise, who you believe women are immediately attracted to. You know, sure. I think I think that. The different casting in that sense could actually change some of the of the viewer imposed narrative. You know that 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 narrative that the viewer says exists, not so much what the director says exists. Right. My guess is that it wasn't too far off from the Doctor Strange Love esque tone that I can only assume the Woody Allen and Mia Farrow version would have likely had, because I know it was more of a comedy. At that point in the 70s. And when Steve Martin got involved, it was starting to fade away from that. That was maybe about 1980. Mm -hmm. They had a meeting. They played chess. They they ate lunch together at Kubrick's estate and went over the book. And everything was set to go. And then other shit happened. And Steve Martin didn't wind up with the role. So, it, yeah, it it's very interesting to... Try to decipher maybe what the underlying meanings of the final version are based off of what could have been with, especially with that character. Yeah, and if uh, if you're taking the conspiracy route, it would be it's strange that a number of at the time high profile celebrities, right? I don't think anybody could deny that uh, Woody Allen at the time or or. Um, Steve Martin at the time that they were potential castings are like through the roof market guys. If you get them in your film, it's, it's, it's going to sell for sure. And, as, and Stanley Kubrick at that time as well. I mean, these are, these are guaranteed money makers. If you're into to the conspiracies, it seems strange that they, both of those guys would through whatever series of events, not be attached to a Kubrick film at that time, or that mm -hmm. he would, think of somebody or suggest somebody or that somebody would know that this person is a potential for casting and that it wasn't directly uh, immediately like, yes, I want to be part of this Kubrick film. Why would I not want to be? 
especially when you hear that from so many other people. I'm seeing a lot in the chat that there is this idea that there's two old men at the end of the film that ca- that carry uh, Tom and Nicole Kidman's character's uh, kid away based off of what these two men are seen earlier in the film in a background sequence. Do you think there's anything to that? Because I, I don't really buy into that. I prob- probably not. I, again, I think we both I think we both agree that the end of the film what you see is either up for interpretation or that's the end, you know, Mm -hmm. and that there's not a whole lot going on after that. They either go home and, and, and fuck, you know, or they shop at the mall for a second. Like, uh, I mean, I I think it's interesting that he would reuse the same two extras. Maybe there's something to that, but this whole element or, or really just in general, that there's a pedophile element to Eyes Wide Shut, I think is complete nonsense because we never see any indication of that whatsoever. I think that's just people who have maybe buried themselves into Reddit for a little too long. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, dug up some old articles and some old things like that. I actually don't find people talking about the film in that context until, um, you know, 10, 11 years later. It's more when we get into like a modern context that people start a- attributing those types of theories to the film. Now, I, I would just say that, again, I-, I-, I frequently believe that Kubrick isn't just telling us like what we see and that there's more to a lot of things. But I, I would say that it's probably one of the more far-fetched things that he would make a film that's not at all about uh, kids getting kidnapped and sexually assaulted and then have one hard to hard to even see reference to it way at the very end. Right. If it was encoded throughout, like, like let's say um, pictures on the wall of the bar, right. Had, ki- had kids in certain situations. If there was, if they ate it, Comet ping pong. Right. Right. If they went to a pizza place, that would all be possible. But yeah, without any type of illusion, I mean, I, I'm guilty of that too, right? I, I allude to things in Kubrick films that might not be there because a lot of a, a lot of us get like um, kind of wrapped up in the Kubrick legend. Yeah, I, I again, uh, I think you're absolutely spot on. There would be other indications that Kubrick had this on his mind, and that this was one of the themes of the movie that was present in these other aspects but there, there's nothing there's nothing there regarding that element it's literally as plain and simple as there is an elitist sex cult there's not even a, a trafficking element for adult women involved right. in the film right there's as far murder as we can tell it's it's a, a it's a consensual involvement you know absolutely absolutely it's, so yeah that it's it seems pretty far-fetched and, and like we we're saying this it's probably not revealed in any uh, missing footage or edited out footage. Again, I think I, we both, although we think maybe potentially different things, I think we both agree that it's probably more that storylines are either closed up or hemmed up or eliminated in the, in the missing edit, you know? Well, what we know based off of things that were released regarding the missing footage, and this is genuinely like the only thing is that there's supposed to be a sequence with, Bill and Alice out on a lake. So it, it it comes back to what you were saying before. Probably other scenes that are establishing their relationship a little bit better mm-hmm. that were ultimately redundant to the plot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But especially if you can, if you think of that, because that is something that I think a lot of filmmakers would do, uh, Kubrick included, is that, okay, we have these two people in a relationship. How can I make you believe this relationship? But it, it's... Uh, not just two competent actors and a competent director, but uh, very clearly conveyed that these two have been in a long-term relationship and that the only, like, sign of distrust is currently being displayed. Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, there's no real need to elaborate more on their relationship. It would just be, it would be redundant, and I think it would make some things more convoluted. Agreed. Uh, where do you think this film falls in Kubrick's filmography? I mean, it's got to be one or two, right? And uh... Really? I think that would be a very unpopular opinion. I, more people have come around to it as of late because 
obviously it was i wouldn't call it maligned mm -hmm. uh there were there was a bit of negative backlash to the film upon its initial release from critics and from audiences but with age people have grown a little warmer towards eyes wide shut but you think it's one of his top two films yeah i think i think that although i said i think the story um has has a uh a, a, a weird like and you know that elongated scene with alice in the beginning kind of is a little bit confusing in some aspects but other than that i mean from a filmmaking standpoint it's got to be one of the one of the most simplistically technical films somebody that just knows their craft they know how to get intimate shots they know how to get you know the right uh, uh lighting to make somebody have a, a a scary gaze without actually having them change their face mm -hmm. somebody that knows how to create foreground and background that's interesting and layered uh uh and and i think on honestly a lot of my opinion comes from the long debate around what the ultimate message is in the film i think that that raises it up because it is it is so artistically expressive that it, it's not immediately understood by everybody that sees it and maybe it's you know maybe it's better to to argue over it than to fully understand every aspect of it mm -hmm. for me i would probably i would i would i yeah, I would make the argument that Eyes Wide Shut is top tier, as in it would probably fall in the top third of his films. So you would, you would, I know that, like, I see the chat here. I, you would probably say Dr. Strangelove is number one. I wouldn't. What you, you wouldn't? Isn't that what you said in uh, uh, the film? Maybe I'm mis misremembering. I won't. Paths of Glory. Paths, Paths, right. of Glory. Paths of Glory. Yeah. That's right. Which is his other war film from the yeah. same time period i find paths of glory to be his just his most well-rounded movie so, what's but, interesting is have you seen that chart of disparities between men and women in what their favorite movies of all time are uh -uh. well paths of glory happened to be on that list i i was very surprised that enough men out there even were familiar with that movie it's very overlooked as mm -hmm. far as kubrick's filmography goes but just an interesting thing it was like paths of glory on the male side and then harry potter one through eight on the female side sure <laughs> Those, yeah. that's the top eight movies but i i think that when it comes to kubrick films i i've never been one to grade them the same way i do everybody else right he gets kind of the kubrick curve where when i'm confused about something it adds to it adds to the film. Yeah. So I I think that you know, 2001: A Space Odyssey is the the best um, film, but I I could argue Eyes Wide Shut um, to compete for it, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good part of what makes those films the 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 best out of them is that it's so hard for them for uh, other films in his discography to actually fully top them because a lot of times we either genuinely agree you know that this is how the shining is this is what it's about um and that it's about technical ability that might rank it higher yeah but in this case it's two films that have um, a discussion around them you know right they they are two of the more ambitious films of his catalog especially 2001 i mean i that that might just be the most ambitious film ever made sure Eyes sure. Wide Shut deals with something a little more internal, obviously. And yeah, there, there's an exploration there that I think when you just look at films that fall into similar categories, it's unrivaled, mm -hmm. you know? There, there's such a richness to the plot and just how a very simple story is told uh, and what it really says about relationships in general between not just married couples but people you know mm -hmm. it's very fascinating you you can pull so much out of again such a very basic story that kubrick has dealt with here so uh in, ju in just the i don't mean to cut you up but in just the like the bill and nick nightingale thing how we were discussing that we, yeah you know we don't really buy that they are 
like college best friends, but that they, they knew each other in college, maybe kind of cool with each other, and are just agreeing to be old chums now here deep into the future. Right. I I think that for for Q, for Kubrick um to dive into the the human condition in that way to look at relationships in that way and to not just do um Ashton Kutcher meets Mila Kunis they break up and then they get back together like mm-hmm. like that in and of itself cre- creates its own like air of mystique around the film that makes it that much better you know Agreed. It, it it definitely is and of course the dream sequences I, i'm not going to like I said, I'm not trying to run on about how technical it is, but how how he conveys something in that film as potentially not reality is just to me masterful. And I see other filmmakers try to do that. I see um, earlier attempts at it, and it's uh, bad, usually. It's bad, usually. Well, as we close out this discussion on Eyes Wide Shut, I do want to get into that general territory with you a little bit because I had seen one comment in the chat that I don't agree with that said that somebody like Kubrick is one in a million, basically. I'm paraphrasing, but just one of a kind, right? And obviously, we haven't seen anybody that resembles Kubrick as far as filmmaking goes uh, in a way that would feel authentic and not necessarily aping of, of his style, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, what, go ahead. Well, I, I guess what I, my, my question that I was going to pose to you real quick was, do you agree with that sentiment that he is one of a kind? Because for me, I feel like what Kubrick did is not impossible for another filmmaker to to do and kind of put their own spin on and obviously make tweaks accordingly. But I do think it's very, very rare and more like you might get a Kubrick once every hundred years. Yeah, I think, I think I'm going to sound like a nerd. I think Christopher Nolan touches on so many things that Kubrick touches on or touched on that if, uh, if if corporate filmmaking was different in the past 10 15 years i think we would have um probably a uh, a discography of near perfect films from nolan i i, I really do, i really do think that i think that films like inception and films like uh, shutter island that are you know they're layered in the same way that kubrick layers films so that uh not just again the foreground the background and the themes can be uh, reanalyzed every time you watch it but after you finish the film when you restart watching it you start developing new like ideas for the characters there's so much to speculate a lot of the times the um of, of motives and things like that that aren't directly i think nolan is close to it when he's like given you know a lot of the reins but to say to say that he's like to say that there's anybody that does exactly what Kubrick does, I think that's difficult just because of everybody's aversion to being too derivative. Yeah. Well, and we've talked about this before that where we've had jokes or sketches that we don't even want to do because we found something that is very similar from forever ago that you never heard of. Right, right. And you just don't want people to be like, well, that's that's copying this, and that's derivative of this. So, so I think too few people will just say, uh, you know, fuck the conventions, and I'm gonna make it up as I as I go, and we're gonna do it a thousand times till I get it right, and I'm I'm gonna be mean about making it happen the right way. I think there's too few directors willing to do that to get a good product. Well, hmm. The thing about Nolan, to me, that I I think he shares with Kubrick and really many directors from the 70s and 80s, and I guess you could even stretch it to the 90s a little bit, is that his films feel like events, right? You you, You get a Nolan film once every three to five years. It's gonna be massive. 
you know you're going to have a good time watching it at least. Uh, something like Dunkirk or or Inception, as you said, these are all like visually stunning films. I don't think he has the same kind of depth that Kubrick has. Then again, who does have the same kind of depth that Kubrick has? Sure. Off the top of my head, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's really anybody that comes close to the style of storytelling, at least that. Kubrick had with each of his films where those that try to do that often come across as try too hard or or it feels a little too on the nose or there, there's just something off about it well do you know I think a lot of times when people like are really pushing for that Kubrick aesthetic or really trying to be you know as close to Stanley Kubrick as possible they end up being pretentious art house films that nobody wants to watch because yeah. I like obviously you know, dudes, like you said, they're they're just trying too hard. But maybe some of it is motive. Like I, I honestly feel like the the motivation for Kubrick to make films is a passion for filmmaking, storytelling, techniques involved with conveying a message. And when you don't have that 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 intimacy with the medium, I think that takes away. F- I think that takes away from the ability to find creative ways. To do your story right you end up more mm-hmm. like like michael bay right he doesn't have the uh, passion for filmmaking that kubrick does his passion comes from what's what's been the uh, most uh, lucrative choices in the past for these films what uh techniques have i used in camera that people will be familiar with if i do them again you know what how can i put my personal stamp on it that you already know Where Mm. if you did, I don't think if you knew Kubrick filmed, you know, each of his films, I don't think the average person could sit down and be like, hey, the same guy directed these. And that's something you do get that with a lot of directors. You, (laughs) Zack Snyder's a Stanley Kubrick over time. (laughs) (laughs) I saw that too. I look, I love Zack Snyder. Don't get me wrong, but uh, we're not, we're not even going to make that comparison. Um, the the thing about uh, Nolan that I wanted to just get back to was I feel like you could easily describe Nolan as somebody who is Kubrick mixed with Spielberg, and I think I think his movies lean a little too close to Spielberg, even though he wants them to lean closer to Kubrick. Mm-hmm. Maybe a movie like Memento or Following, sure, uh, could could be a little bit closer to some of Kubrick's earlier works. Maybe Mm -hmm. Dunkirk is, uh, no, Dunkirk feels more like Spielberg. I I, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. That's why, that's why I thought uh, using Shutter Island as a reference, right? Because that film itself is, is constructed in such a way to be uh, sometimes a little confusing and, almost never um it almost never just like leaves you a trail of bre- breadcrumbs to the official the, the official narrative the official story you know it's a yeah. uh, it's little pieces here and there that kind of expose the the end game and i think just in crafting that narrative is like the the most kubrick thing that he will have, will have done when his career comes to an end but you know, if if I'm being like generous to the whole of the directing community, I think Sandy Kubrick's stamp is so heavily ingrained in the medium that there's a lot of people that maybe accidentally pick up some of his filmmaking traits just because they become staples. Like I, I you know, people using low and lo- low long shots is a little bit more common now, post in the post Kubrick era, mm-hmm. where uh, before. I think Kubrick's the only guy I'd seen use that specific tracking shot like as frequently as he has. Well, he's the best. I mean, I, I, I think if you were to poll most people, they would have Stanley Kubrick as the top of the list. You're, so you're, you're absolutely going to find elements to his filmmaking in probably some of the most generic work hmm. or, or amateur. Uh, it, it, it's hard to steer away from in, in some regards. Uh, do you think that there are any new directors on the scene aside from Nolan, who I wouldn't even consider new at this point? He's been around for 25 years. Um, 
that have potential um, to to be in the same league or close to the same league, because obviously that's that's a big there's a big tier uh, of of disparity between Kubrick and even the best director working right now. Uh, yeah, I think I think that I know it's not necessarily new. Um, but I think, well, not even Heat. So the guys that did uh, Stranger Things, the Russo brothers, the Russo, there's there are two different ones, right? Yeah. The guys that did uh, the Marvel. Oh, no, the films. Russo brother. No, the Russo brothers did the Avengers movie. But, right. The, so so whatever this the the brothers did the Stranger Things um, series, right? That they've directed Stranger Things. Their uh, attention to detail, as far as the zeitgeist of the time. I think lends itself to make more period pieces that can be interpreted by a lot of people in the future in different ways. Uh, but like, I mean, to, to, to me, there are very few directors that intentionally seek out complicated projects in the same way that Kubrick d- did to make really, um, innovative and forward-thinking film, but what, maybe like uh, uh, Lars von Trier. I know he's like old or whatever, but like Lars von Trier will take on concepts that might be difficult for other people. Well, I'll I'll tell you what Lars von Trier has in common with Kubrick that a lot of filmmakers do not is that each of his movies stands out and has the layers to it. Maybe not as many layers as a Kubrick film, but it's almost novelesque mm-hmm. when you when you're sitting down and you're watching a Lars von Trier film because you know that there's going to be aspects that are designed to manipulate your emotions in a bad way or maybe tease you or maybe make you confused it's more of an experience and you can't judge it on the same level as you would any generic box office vehicle that has been released this past weekend you know you you can't go okay let me review the house that Jack built against Creed Two. Right, <laughs> right. It, like it just doesn't it doesn't work that way. So Lars von Trier is absolutely one of those guys, but I wouldn't put him in the same category as a Kubrick. I think you have, I think Kubrick is in a tier of his own at the very top, and then you have a second tier, which is made up of guys like. I'll use some foreign directors here, like a Jodorowsky or Lars von Trier, as we just said, or, um, fuck, what's his name who did Solaris? Um, Damn it. Uh Uh-oh. Right on the tip of my tongue. You got me there. Uh, Or an Akira Kurosawa, or or any director like that that has this established order to their filmmaking uh, and gives great care to the movies that they make. They usually won't do commercial projects. And then you have... The American category, which is Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, guys like that who do go commercial. And then maybe between those two tiers, you have someone like a Brian De Palma who has one foot in one tier and one foot in the other. Yeah. When you if you if you account for directors from beforehand, I think guys like Sergio Leone and yeah. Akira Kurosawa actually probably exist in that in the, in a similar tier as Kubrick, but sure the the foreign film works so much differently. You know, I guess uh, as far as like a baseline, I think I would say Akira and uh, Kubrick probably. I mean, they're probably like right right next to each other, right? The I would have more actually to say about a lot of Akira, Akira Kurosawa films than I do about Kubrick films, and I've been here for like mm. three hours. You know, yeah. So I think they definitely compete, but since, since his passing, I don't, I don't see that there's like somebody who really gets super close to that Kubrick status. Again, I think of guys like Lars von Trier or some films by Christopher Nolan as being Kubrick-esque, but I think that that, that bar is too high to really get to. And I don't think people should even try, like, not, not that you shouldn't try, but you, more filmmakers should be looking to 
catch that intimacy with the viewer that Kubrick has rather than that masterfulness of the craft that Kubrick has. I also think that there is something else in play with Kubrick's films and why they were revered in a different way than if you were to look at the filmography of a David Lynch, perhaps. And I think it has something to do with the choices he made regarding what movie projects he decided to go with. There's a weird, almost like anal retentiveness to his filmography, whether that was intended or not, where he would not do a movie unless there was a book that preexisted that he could base the script off of. And if a book didn't exist, then he would commission a writer to go do a manuscript of the book. Like Arthur C. Clarke is the famous example of that for 2001. Yeah. Where he he had an idea. I think he read some articles and he he got together with Arthur C. Clarke, had him write the manuscript to 2001 based off of his outline for the script and then took it from there. The other thing with Kubrick's filmography is that it is small. It is small and well-contained. There are only about... 12 to 14 films, depending on whether or not you count something like The Seafarers or uh, Killer's Kiss, you know, the, these very early films of his. Yeah, I mean, they probably don't really count. I, I, w- I would say that his first real movie would be The Killing, mm-hmm. that, that you could count. Maybe you could make the argument for Fear and Desire, because there are absolutely flashes of brilliance in that, even though it is very rough around the edges. Some of the screenwriting in that and just the lines of dialogue are great, even if the actors aren't. Yeah. But I think there is something to having a filmography that is, generally speaking, smaller than the average filmmaker. It keeps it neater. And the fact that he died before his time, but thank God he died before any kind of social media or uh, whatever. You know, for all we know, he could have pulled a J.K. Rowling and just started retconning his own movies like, well, actually... Jack was gay in The Shining. You know? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the the, the he the was the future. bear. You know, <laughs> like yeah, the it, it, future would have been weird. Absolutely, and he he did die young. He yeah. died, I feel like, at fifty nine or something, or maybe even younger than that. And I think that's probably a big problem with like the modern uh, film making culture is that a lot of people have a lot of films. You know, they work a lot. They've made a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily know um, that maybe didn't get aired, didn't play all the way through, only showed in so many countries. They have Netflix, you know, 15 minute film, short film or whatever. I well, think, I go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think a lot of it comes back to what we were talking about before we even went officially live with this episode, the whole Kevin Hart thing. There's a, there's a need in the modern celebrity, the modern, uh, you know, entertainer to keep that workload consistent, even if they have everything they could ever need or or want. Uh, You don't have people that are willing to, or so willing to not play by the rules that they're, they're dealt. And I think Kubrick was a rare instance, maybe one of the last instances of somebody who had final cut control within a big studio system while that still exists and that that's not really around anymore that's that's like a that's a big thing because you see i like i wonder how much of the filmmaking landscape is ruined by how immensely popular the um, marvel uh, mcu is right because that you very clearly see people if you play you play ball You'll get that big blockbuster, right? You could be Brie Larson. You don't have to make a single uh, single good film ever. You could be essentially boring, and you'll still get that big money deal as an actor. You could be a meh uh, director uh, like John Favreau, like a, you know, a competent director, but not a great director like John Favreau, and still mm-hmm. get the, the big call of The Lion King. I wonder how much of those massively unbelievably popular uh, Disney factory pumped out films have sort of you know, tar- tarnished the future of filmmaking and that there really no reason for a studio to say, all right, dude, I'm going to give you full reins of this film. 
um, just bring me back something that meets the conventional FCC rating. You know, if it, yeah. as long as it makes it to R, you're good. I, I well, There's no incentive for a studio or production company to do that. I think it, I think it, really offsets the current playing field in a couple of different ways. Also, I just wanted to make a correction. Kubrick died at 70, not at 59. So not thank that you. It's only 11 years off. No big deal. Well, 59 <laughs> seems way more tragic than 70. Than 70. <laughs> 70. He had a nice full life. You know? um, yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. They wind up also contracting these actors and these filmmakers who do have talent. Like I know... Uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of enthusiasm around somebody like a James Gunn or even the Russo brothers before they got their hands on any of the Marvel properties from community. And you see them get wrapped up in this system and it kind of drains them of their life and their creative, uh, they're just like their creative glands, really. Like a Josh Trank is another a perfect example of that. Somebody who couldn't hack it, yeah, yeah. bowed out, got blacklisted, and he might make a comeback just because Tom Hardy is willing to work with him, or he might not. He might just stay disappeared, you know? So I think that changes things a lot. I think, I, I and it's really unfortunate the way that some directors' careers go once they get a taste of that blockbuster success uh i think unfortunately maybe i might be speaking too soon i think jordan peele might be a case of that as well where suddenly his name is being roped into all these different franchises that aren't necessarily superhero related although his name was attached to the flash for a period of time mm -hmm. uh, i know he's attached to the twilight zone and a couple of other things i think that you might wind up seeing that be the case with him as well after Get Out, which was a good debut. Well, look how frequently they market that aspect of this movie is directed by this person and produced by this person. And I, I, in conversations with other people, I've had people say, oh, man, this movie is good because it's produced by, um, you know, M. Night Shyamalan. I had somebody say that the, what was it, Devil, the, the scary elevator <laughs> movie was due. Yeah. Produced that, by dude, one of his best films, bro. Produced by uh, uh, M. Night Shyamalan, dude. You got to see it. I'm like, dog, who cares if it's produced <laughs> by this by this dude who's made other yeah, shitty yeah. films recently? Yeah. But that they market a lot of films like that. And I think that that draws a lot of people so deep into the that corporate fact, the, you know, the film factory that, yeah, potentially like somebody like Jordan Peele, I mean, he could be. He he could be drained of of his creative juices by by twenty twenty even. And I also think that the influence of these movies on people who are filmmakers or just enjoy that medium, it's changing what it means to be a good film or what it even means to be a film. Because you know I, I've I've made so many complaints now about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so I'll I'll, I'll be brief here. But one of the biggest complaints I had with Avengers Infinity War, maybe I'll do a proper episode on it at some point, was that it didn't feel like a movie. It felt like you have three episodes of a TV show glued together here. Mm -hmm. And I understand that after 20 movies in this universe, you don't want to go through the motions of explaining the context of certain things. You just want people to be up to date and roll with it. And that's fine. But it is going to strip away something that feels filmic about what it is you've produced. Uh, if you don't have a traditional three-act structure that obeys the laws of cinema or a, a, a conventional story within cinema, then what you have is a TV show, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think that's what people are now looking at is like, well, these are really good films. And it's like, no, but the, the, like... They aren't even films to begin with. If you want to say that they're well-made, I will probably agree with you there more often than not. But if this becomes something to aspire to, and obviously it's something to aspire to for a lot of these production companies where they do want to build the cinematic universes or uh, vague sequels, like even uh, the what was going to be the remake of Big Trouble in Little China is now going to be a sequel to right. the original film so they can build a universe to make money off of. It's 
a scary notion I, as far as the future of filming, the filmmaking goes. Well, and then and then you have like uh, I know we're like a little bit off topic or whatever, but and then you have you have Quentin Tarantino who will make what one more film and then be done, and or within existing directors right now or existing directors that actually write a good portion of their own story um mm. they he's essentially the like last one he might get a little bit more freedom than a lot of people but he's he's the he's the last cowboy out here that after after someone like uh, Quentin Tarantino makes his final film and goes away i think that big studios control every single director all the way i think tarantino was a, aware of the shifting climate in the 80s and that's probably why he set up his what is it what the nine film or ten film uh uh and then oh and then be done you know yeah that, his his whole notion has been for a while that he's going to do 10 films and then retire and become a novelist right and i, I think i think a lot of that has to do with an understanding of the shifting climate of film because you do see uh, people looking directly at the concept of making a fuck ton of money uh, rather than making a very good film early on. You know, let's like like Robocop 2 exists, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go, finish oh, I was going to say, no. so, so I definitely think that to to wrap up that whole idea that, that the stamp left by Kubrick is is big and a lot of people are influenced by him, but that guys that actually have the the technical ability and the passion to create something along with the freedom to create something that stands the test of time is is that that time is pro probably coming to an end very soon now let me ask you something because one of the first answers you gave as far as will there be a new kubrick or somebody who is kubrick-esque was the duo behind stranger things which mm -hmm. Uh, I'll agree with you on that they definitely captured the 80s well. Uh, maybe not accurately, but accurate to what we perceive the 80s to be like right now. They they definitely built a, a good atmosphere there. Uh, I liked this, the first season. I had a very negative opinion about the second season. But to what I'm getting at is... Um, Something that I had talked about on the podcast with Jake Hanrahan where we were going over Pi was how the mediums are not only changing, but in some regards, they're melting away. What it means to be a movie is different now than what it might have meant in 1988 or 1943. Or, or, and what it means to be a television show now is absolutely different than what it even meant 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, do you see a director growing to prominence through the field of television the same way that we would have seen uh, in film? Are, w would you say that the guys behind Stranger Things would maybe be a duo that is like that? And do you see maybe some pre-existing directors Yeah, the crossing the, over? So I think the guys from... Um... Stranger Things definitely. I wish we could remember their name, but um, the Duffer Brothers. Duffer, right? Duffer. That's what it is. The Duffer Brothers. Um, yeah, I think in a a lot of ways, their te like technical ability and attention to detail is um, something that can that can carry them from project to project, right? Because no, no matter what, if you give them a concept. I think that they'll be able to to craft the narrative and and present it in such a way that most people would find it entertaining mm -hmm. um, to some degree. Right now, obviously, the se like the second season of um, Stranger Things is uh, not great, but I'll, they don't write the vast majority of it. But that first season is almost entirely penned by them. There's other writers there working on their collective idea. But they had a lot more influence in it, and were able to use that con that MK Ultra concept. And I thought, as far as like the visual presentation of it, I thought it was really like like forward thinking. You know, this is how we're gonna shoot this stuff. And a lot of people don't shoot the 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 
their version of a negative zone or a, the upside down as it's portrayed in a lot of different shows and films did differently this concept um they had a really original way of of doing that and i think that if given the reins they could consistently produce something that most people would look at and say like this is uh good and i like the guys that made this so i think uh like Vince uh Vince Gilligan is one of those guys that his ability to structure a narrative and use the the lens, the foreground and background, all the things I would say about Kubrick and for television is masterful, right? I think the X Files mm-hmm. has a number of episodes that are some of the best best shows or best episodes of a television show on TV in general. But the limitations from studios or maybe even like individual creative limitations means that there's sometimes well uh, like it, it's it, sometimes i feel like what somebody might want to do if given full creative uh freedom might end up more or less ruining their career and that somebody like say like the Duffer brothers might sometimes need somebody to rein them in because you don't want to end up with a crazy space opera. But uh-huh. I think, yeah, I think from television, you could like from, from the, the concept of a, a, a series, you know, you could end up getting people like the Duffer brothers moving up the ranks. I don't, I couldn't name any specifically right offhand. Uh, but I, I definitely think that moving up the ranks through television is more possible now than ever just because so, so many shows get to use the the filmmaking medium and compress it you know that they're really stretching out a movie into 10 parts and doing it the right way although it's hard to do in, in a lot of cases you know i would say the perfect example of that would be i don't know if you saw season three of twin peaks that David Lynch directed all 17 or 18 hours of that. Oh. And it didn't feel it didn't feel like a television show. And it certainly didn't feel like the original Twin Peaks. It felt more like a David Lynch film that, you know, as you said before, just so happened to be stretched out among all of those episodes. Would you consider a season or even a a full series of a television show to necessarily go along with a filmography for a director because maybe i just have a differing opinion of television because uh you know we come from an era where you know a tv show also happens to be family matters or or happens to be (laughs) three's company whatever it might be you know uh there's a a lower standard of what's acceptable than film not necessarily across the board, but just generally speaking, in in a commercial market, uh, does are are they? You know, can you compare the two? Do they go together? Well, yeah, I think so. I think a a director is going to carry his style from film um, to film, and oftentimes, like with David Lynch, um, from film to TV. You know, mm-hmm. um, but. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't see a good reason to say, like, these two things have to exi- exist separately. And I think that sometimes they can be even compared against each other, you know? Sure. It maybe, maybe you did really good four episodes of this show, but a really shitty movie one time. And they, I think that it's not unfair to compare those things or, you know, to, to talk about those things at the same time in the same league. Uh, because you you are going to take your style to every project. Uh, right. But in that case, then why don't we compare a book that David Lynch wrote along with, uh, you know, blue velvet or something like that, that, that. This is where I wind up tripping up on the idea of this is because it is a different medium as close as it is to film uh, that I don't know if it's necessarily fair to equate these two. Especially since, you know, Twin Peaks Season 3 is a different story. Obviously, Mm -hmm. same medium, but, you know, you take a look at something like uh, Vince Gilligan's work, right? Mm -hmm. And The X-Files or The Lone Gunman, where other people had their hands involved in these properties. And, you know, at any point, AMC could have stripped Breaking Bad away from Vince Gilligan the same way that they did The Walking Dead, 
with uh, I believe it was Robert Kirkman, right? Right. Yeah. And that the, makes it difficult to to say, okay, well, this is on the same the same level as something that you know a director may have had complete involvement in from start to finish. Although I, you know, I guess in that way, if it was done under a studio label, there have been plenty of instances of movies being torn from a director. I mean, Zack Snyder was mentioned earlier tonight in the chat. Justice League is a prime example of that, where they handed it over to Joss Whedon and tried to fit it into a Marvel mold. So, I don't know. Well, uh, and uh, um, didn't Ron Howard take over for... Oh, yeah, Solo is another one, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, so, maybe in their most bare-bones comparison, right? So, if the narrative, if the if constructing a narrative can be compared between, I think that that's what I'm trying to say, is you can compare constructing a narrative in a film and TV and a book, right? But sure, I guess the execution of that narrative is different for each medium. And mm-hmm. I think that if, if you're going to compare a, a movie to a TV show, there's a lot of elements that you can compare because, you know, you have the aspect of it's still filmmaking, right? It's still a shot. It's still lighting. It's still acting. Um, it's, it's still interpretive through the visual medium where through the literature you have to explain things a certain way and and have a rich dialogue you can't just say some of that shit was red uh, was, you, you know you, you have to say it had red velvet you know so you have to you have to use visual language but right. as long as the narrative is constructed in such a way that you can move from beginning to end and hit all the right peaks when it's supposed to be, um, you know, when you're supposed to feel sad, you feel sad when you're supposed to be unnerved. You are unnerved. I think you can always compare that ability to construct a narrative from doesn't matter what uh, uh, an individual works on. And I think we'll do the same when Quentin Tarantino puts his first book out. If it's about, you know, two hitmen, I think immediately we'll be like, yeah, Pulp Fiction but also how does he create and execute the narrative of these two hitmen? Maybe, mm. maybe it makes a, uh, for a better book than it does for, for a film when you have more time to, you, know, you can write it for over the course of 15 years, you can write one day into a book and know that in five years, you're going to write the second day. That stuff is hard to compare, but when you have just the narrative itself, I think that, and he used a perfect example in David Lynch in that you, are you, I think you absolutely can compare a film of his to, um, like, say, Twin Peaks or any of his, like, light light novels, isn't that what they're called, or uh, any of his other writings, you know? Yeah. As long as it's a, a, a narrative-based writing. But, like, it would be yeah. it would be pretty, like, dumb to take a, a you know, if, if Werner Herzog had a narrative-based film and then compare it to you know, his, his manuscript about living amongst prisoners, you know? Sure. Uh, Carrie Fukunaga's name was brought up in the chat with, uh, the first season of True Detective. Yeah. You know what? I would have actually said that Carrie Fukunaga was the leading candidate to be a successor to Stanley Kubrick up until he signed a deal with Netflix and then agreed to do that Bond movie. So I don't think so. Yeah, that that's a killer. That's again like what we were saying. Studios, I I can't imagine a guy like Fer- K- Kerry Fukunaga after making what is one of the best seasons of television. That first season, True Detective, and th- that's the thing too is I don't even look at True Detective as a TV show. I don't, I, you know, when I think about the first season of True Detective, I'm like, oh well, that was a movie. Oh wait, no, 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 it was a TV show. I have to correct myself. Like that's how good and complete and rich it felt. And, you know, the, the fact it was only six episodes definitely worked to its benefit uh, as well. Now, Carrie Fukunaga had all kinds of interesting almost mm-hmm. opportunities. Like, obviously, I did a series on how he was teed up to go and direct the uh, new adaption of it. Oh, you did a series on that? What was that called? That was uh, Deconstructing Carrie Fukunaga's It. That's right, on the Lower as Wonder Bread YouTube channel, forward slash (laughs) (laughs) Deconstructing. Thank you, thank you. And uh, 
he was also, and this is what's maybe even more interesting than that, and I think he might actually still be attached, I'm not sure, was that he was going to do Stanley Kubrick's unrealized Napoleon film. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be for HBO. And uh, Steven Spielberg was going to be the executive producer on it. And then I think they passed it over to some nobody. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's back in Fukunaga's court. I have no idea. But the fact that he went on to ink a deal with Netflix to do Maniac, which has kind of received... Look, you, you look at Rotten Tomatoes and it's got good reviews, but the word on the street is very middling about the show. And I haven't finished it yet. Some of the episodes are good. Some of the episodes are whatever. That's a Jonah Hill and Emma Stone, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Have you watched that or no? I've not. I've not. You know what? I uh, my absolutely cannot stand Emma Stone in anything other than Birdman, but because Whoa. it's it's not she's not the main character, so mm-hmm. I haven't actually even cared to watch it. But if you've been at all entertained by it from now, I might check it out because the theme is interesting to me. There are definitely some worthwhile episodes in there. Unfortunately. It seems kind of scattershot, as in, you know, I, I've tuned into maybe about five or six of the episodes, right? And I think there's eight or nine total. And it's literally about like a 50% accuracy mm. uh, rating for me. But uh, anyway, he has signed on to replace Danny Boyle on the new James Bond film. And I think the minute you do a big commercial property like that, even if it's Bond, which maybe lends itself to having uh, a bit more leniency than other franchises to mess around and play with the formula. I think once you do that, you're tapping out. Well, you could see that the, that his struggles with the uh, more corporate production world of it in again, from your, your film on it, uh, on the, the deconstruct of it, you can see that obviously producer input is going to be something that drives him away from a project. But I guess maybe an initially that might have been a problem for him, but he see I think it's the thing you have to play ball, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise you do get blacklisted. He probably does have better projects he would rather be working on, but like you you got to you got to play ball. Yeah. Uh well on that note, we're now hitting the two hour and 30 minute mark. So I think we got two episodes and one here. Uh, was there anything else about Eyes Wide Shut or Kubrick in general you wanted to put a pin in before we close out the episode? Um, yeah, I read a review that calls Stanley Kubrick a racist for not putting a black person in the orgy scene. <laughs> really yep. is this real or are I, you yep i found that when i was looking for some stuff earlier today i did find that and i thought that was uh one of the more shallow film analysis i'd actually ever read hmm. i thought it was i mean it's a it's a Kubrick film like he's just he's he's casting as few people as possible on those <laughs> yeah like i mean people in that movie and honestly, if, if you were to think back to the Rothschilds or, or any of those parties back in the 70s or the 60s, I think it's all going to be very wealthy white people. Like, 100%. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think you're going to see any variations there or, you know, it, maybe they'll, they'll bring in, a, you know, like a Chinaman or something. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, that person's an idiot. Yeah, that, um, was, that was really the only thing that uh, I wanted to mention before I bounce. I, gotta, I really appreciate you letting me come on here and uh, talk over you and ramble. This was a great discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground. And uh, obviously we have a theme here. So until the the next Kubrick film that we cover, have you, are there any Kubrick movies that you haven't watched yet? Uh, I, I guess I wouldn't know. A name. I haven't... Um... Because I have one. I have one left that I actually own on Blu-ray, and I've just been saving for the occasion. And it it could actually be considered Kubrick's one venture into the commercial market. Which 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 is uh, Spartacus. Okay. That turned him off to doing commercial films forever. Um, I think when it comes to Kubrick, I think I've pretty much seen everything. Maybe not like... uh, I've seen Spartacus... Um, I haven't seen like you know these documentaries. 
uh, The Killing. I think maybe The Killing. I haven't seen. I I probably haven't seen it in so long. That's about it. The, um, the Killing's great. That one has uh, Timothy Carey in it as well. He's he's one of the three convicted soldiers of what do they get him on uh, treason or or cowardice uh, in Paths of Glory. He he's great in The Killing. The Killing's a very good good movie. It's it's one of those directors where. I mean, his discography is a number of my favorite films in Full yeah. Metal Jacket, The Shining, A Clockwork Orange, 2001, A Space Odyssey. I mean, even like a, a lesser known film, lesser watched films, Lolita. You know, I think it's it's one, it's just one of those directors that I think uh, after having made it a point to watch everything, the only thing I don't haven't seen probably in 10 years is The Killing. I would have to recommend to you, there's this new documentary that's now out on Netflix, and I was going to do an episode on this with uh, another upcoming guest called uh, Film Worker that covers the entire career of Leon Vitale, who was an actor, you might have seen him as Barry Lyndon's uh, adopted son who winds up uh, shooting him and really destroying his life. I, I don't know of any other notable roles he had. Oh, aside from Red Cloak in, in this movie. <laughs> right, aside from right. being an unfaced person. Sure. Um, he might have been, he might have had a role in A Clockwork Orange as well. He has a very recognizable face, I will say that. Uh, but he basically gave up his acting career to be Kubrick's right-hand man on set. And the documentary is about him. There's also another doc documentary on Netflix about uh, like his personal assistant, who's like this little Italian guy who used to be a race car driver. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did the same thing, but, like just basically gave up his whole life to aid Kubrick. It, it's, it's crazy. Both of these movies are very educational, though, in learning more about uh, his methodology. And it also confirms that a lot of the legend isn't just legend about Kubrick and his filmmaking style. That's that's one thing I did want to say is that it it always feels like when people um, talk about Stanley Kubrick is is not always, but a lot of times, especially with Eyes Wide Shut, there's some type of reference that maybe um, maybe we think more of the dude than what is what is true, but right. Just like with Full Metal Jacket, as I'm looking into the creative process of Eyes Wide Shut, I find nothing but points validating opinions of Stanley Kubrick. You know, that his, uh, along, not just his work ethic and his attention to detail, but the intimate relationship that he builds with the people he's working with as, as their boss. So not necessarily like being their friend friend but un like he understood a lot about tom cruise and knew how to get a good performance out of a guy who really was never asked to do a whole lot tom mm -hmm. cruise and i think that, that tom cruise gives one of his better performances in the film because he has someone like stanley kubrick to to drive him and understand what his real range is, not what just he thinks, what range he thinks he has, you know? There's so much to be unearthed with this movie, but uh, we'll we'll have to do another one of these in about 10 episodes or so. <laughs> I think it's been that time since Full Metal Jacket and cover something different, maybe from a different era of uh, of Kubrick, since we, we covered his two, well, the two final films in his in his lineup. Yeah, yeah, we're going backwards. Well, kind of backwards. Yeah, a little out of order. So next up would have been, what, The Shining? <laughs> right. <laughs> actually, I, I, I could actually go for The Shining. So Yeah, I'm into I don't it. Know. Yeah. Uh, and then Barry Lyndon. Oh, man, Barry Lyndon. What do you think about Barry Lyndon before we wrap up? Um, uh, One of the, like, it's it's one of the better um, business films. B business films? Yeah. What do, you, what, do, what do you mean by that? Bear, Barry Lyndon, like about the business. No, oh yeah, you're absolutely correct about that. You know, I hated Barry Lyndon when I first watched it. I was, but, but I also have this uh, stigma against period pieces in general. So if I see somebody in a wig, like a powdered wig, I'm just like, ah, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm in, I'm in for a rough time. But I, I rewatched it like two times in a row, mm -hmm. somewhat recently, and I was like, oh my god, how could I be so ignorant? Oh, the, the, it, sorry. It's it's climbing the charts very quickly as one of my favorite Kubrick films. It might be in the top 
three or four. It's it's hilarious and ah, oh, it's just it's so good. It's I so good. am an idiot and actually I just completely confused the uh, two films. I'm I'm on the right page right now. Yes, Barry Lyndon, great period piece film. Not at all about the business. As well, I at, said before, <laughs> I, I actually thought that uh, you were getting at the whole social networking aspect to Barry Lyndon, where he's just climbing. You know, he's he's a social climber. That's so. exactly what I meant. Yep. <laughs> I want, what what movie were you talking about? Um, <laughs> I will, I'll tell you off stream or whatever. <laughs> oh Jesus! Was it um, like Wall Street? Money never sleeps. No. What's that? Uh, what's that Johnny Depp film? Oh Jesus, Johnny Depp! Um, this is off to a terrible start already, my, my dude. Uh, it's like one thirty in the morning. Uh, <laughs> shit, what's the? Uh, here he's he's a uh, he's that director. It's black and white. It's from like ninety two. Black and oh, Ed Wood. Yeah, Ed, Ed Wood. Wood. Yeah, Ed Wood. Wow, Ed, that is a very different movie. Man, it's not. That's Tim Burton. See, and now you now you're gonna get so many dislikes for that one part. See, Frederick says goodbye. Yeah, like, up shit, dude. Wow, that is a, that is right. a huge. I'm, I'm fuck losing up. subscribers as we speak, man. Oh, was, message deleted. He just he took, it back. he took it back. <laughs> fuck, dude. There goes my Oscars, dude. Never Ed Wood. That is that's uh, that's a very good film, and also Tim Burton's <laughs> another great example of someone who went commercial and killed their career. Sure. Did you did, have you seen Barry Lyndon? Yeah, I have seen Barry Lyndon. I just watched a. Uh, 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 historical comparison between like costumes and settings right and Bar uh, and barry linden was one of the films that was discussed in it and uh, so like i was like maybe five days ago i actually feel pretty stupid i'm glad you're not on camera <laughs> yeah uh the one of the, one of the most noteworthy things about barry linden that i thought was just spectacular but it actually took me a couple of times to notice was that um the reliance on candlelight for that movie and then I, I looked into it and it was like yeah Kubrick used entirely natural lighting and candlelight to shoot the film it's just like that's especially in 1970 that's amazing well if, if uh, and I know we'll talk about this in the future but if you look at the um, like makeup aesthetic right how it, like the men are obviously going to wear a lot of this white cover with blush and bright red yeah. lips actually probably the better way to light that is going to be with like a yellow natural light as opposed mm -hmm. to you know these the the bright stage lightings that you would usually use just for uh just to maintain the aesthetic because your room isn't going to be as brightly lit in uh in, in the 1700s as it's going to be in in you know 1970 something you know what i mean so yeah it's actually it's another one of those instances of the guy just having a a another level of technical like expertise we will be back soon and check out the newest episode of movies enjoy <laughs> <laughs>